History tells the story of the world and of our lives. Sometimes that history goes bump in the night. Broadcasting from the center of oddity and the supernatural in Central Florida, it's the History Goes Bump podcast. Hello, you spooktacular people. Welcome to this 317th episode of the History Goes Bump podcast, Ghost Tours for the Theater of the Mind. I am your host, Diane. And I'm your host, Kelly. Wait, wait, what did you just say? (laughs) I said, and I'm your host, Kelly. (laughs) Oh, my goodness. Wait, what? What, what? (laughs) I guess the cat is out of the bag. (laughs) Kelly is now going to be joining me as co-host of the History Goes Bump podcast. I'm so excited. Kelly, I've been wanting to bring you on for a while, but I wanted to be fair and give things a little bit of time. Absolutely. And I feel we're in a good space now to bring you on. I enjoy doing the podcast solo, but it is so much better as a duo. And I've actually heard that from a lot of listeners that they really miss the back and forth of having a duo on History Ghost Bump. So we're back to where we should be. (laughs) Here we go. Buckle in. (laughs) And on this episode, we have a really interesting topic to talk about. Absolutely. The Legend of Elementals. I am so excited to learn more. Well, I'm looking forward to sharing it with all of the listeners. But before we do that, we want to welcome into the Spooktacular crew, Samantha, Brittany, and Shelly with a Y. Thanks for joining us, guys. And now this moment, Naughty. The moment Naughty was suggested by Jenny Rains. Black mangrove trees do something really weird. So do eucalyptus trees and camphor trees. In the 1920s, this weird phenomenon was first documented and scientists have studied it ever since and tried to figure out why it happens. This phenomenon is known as crown shyness. You've probably seen it for yourself. Next time you're in a dark forest looking for Bigfoot or fairies, Look up and see if you notice a network of cracks between the canopies of trees. This almost looks like tiles laid next to each other with grout in between or jigsaw pieces nearly connected together. One of the reasons why scientists can't figure out the why is because it doesn't happen all the time. Some have theorized that crown shyness is the result of abrasion. This is a fancy way to say that branches brushing against each other cause twigs to break. And it's a good theory until scientists survey trees in high wind areas and found no increase in crown shyness. Other scientists think that maybe light has something to do with it. This hypothesis basically states that the tips of trees can detect light levels, and this will cause the tips to stop growing. Whatever the cause, it does help prevent the spread of damaging insects. Looking up at crown shyness is breathtaking, but is also a phenomenon that certainly is odd. And now, this month in history. In the month of December, on the 7th and 43 BC, Cicero is beheaded. The year before his death, lawyer Marcus Tullius Cicero became one of the most powerful men in Rome when Julius Caesar was murdered. He was an outspoken critic of Octavian, who was Caesar's heir, and Mark Antony. Two men, Papalius and Heranius, were sent to take care of Cicero, and they caught up with him as he went out to find a ship to take to the coast. When Cicero was approached by the men, he knew what they had come to do, and he basically put up no fight and asked that they give him a quick and clean death. And they did. Heranius drew his sword and cut off Cicero's head. 
He then cut off his hands and brought the head and hands back to Antony, who hung them in the forum. Antony felt like he was vindicated by taking the hands that had written mocking speeches about him, but the Roman people saw it more as a symbol of the darkness in Antony's soul. lives are touched nearly every day by the four elements. We breathe air, drink water, eat things fed by the earth, and cook or warm ourselves with fire. There are stories of ancient creatures that are one with these elements, and we've come to know them as elementals. Elementals show up in a variety of places, from books to comics to legends of old. Is there any possibility that these mythic beings did actually or could actually exist? On this episode, we explore the history, stories, and possibilities of elementals. I mentioned comics and elementals in the intro there because for me, Kelly, that's where I first learned about elementals. I've always been interested in other types of spirits that basically go back and forth with nature. That's always been a big draw for me and always something that I felt very connected to. Did you read comics when you were a kid? I did not. Unfortunately, I really wasn't introduced to them. You poor thing. I know. It's so very sad. (laughs) Well, and for girls, there's a lot of times when they would not read the kind of comics that I was reading. They might read the Walt Disney ones or Richie Rich, the Archie comics. (laughs) Essentially, the comics that I got to read were in the Sunday paper. (laughs) Okay. That was well, about it. <laughs> I was a DC girl. So that's those are the ones that I I, that I like to read. And for the most part, I still am, although we've watched a lot of the Marvel movies and I have become a fan of them through their movies. We have. It's been fantastic. I mean, the, the recent ones especially. I've gotten into fights with people over superheroes versus mutants and which is better. Oh my word. Yeah, I'm 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 a lover, not a fighter. <laughs> Well, back when I was reading comics, I don't get a chance to do that anymore. I'm just too busy. But my favorite hero and comic was Firestorm. For those of you who are listening who know anything about DC Comics, if you know Firestorm, you're probably a little bit older because he's just not around very much anymore. A little bit of an elemental, possibly. Yeah, well, what happened is I own nearly all of the comics that he's in. And I remember keenly about the time I started college. Okay, so it was... um, (laughs) A little bit ago? (laughs) 89, 90. I wasn't even out of high school. I remember that... (laughs) Shush. I remember that Firestorm underwent a huge change and he became the fire elemental. And I also followed a comic called Swamp Thing a little bit. I wasn't as into that one, but he was considered the earth elemental. So this was basically my introduction to these things called elementals. Later, though, as I got more into the paranormal and legends, I started to learn more about the elementals and their connection to the four main elements. Kelly and I both have a real connection to nature. And so for us, it's easy to be connected to the elements. Absolutely. I mean, from the time I was a child, not through comics, but always rescuing animals, always trying to rehab everything, always enjoying gardening and just being out in nature. I can say you are very handy when it comes to plants. You're very good about that. No, oh, thank you. I have I have one and a half green thumbs that I, I kind of attribute to my father, but I've always been drawn to that and always enjoyed it and for the most part done well with it. Well, that makes up for the fact that I have a negative green thumb. You do not. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not as good about it. A lot of what I plant ends up dying. Well, I will keep it going along. And we're looking forward to creating a wonderful garden in our backyard. Oh my gosh, I'm so excited. <laughs> One day, when we have time. <laughs> yeah, all, all that spare time on our hands, definitely. <laughs> So we all know the basic four elements, air, water, land, and fire. Theophrastus von Hohenheim, more commonly known as Paracelsus, was born around 1493, and he was a physicist and alchemist nicknamed the father of toxicology. 
Aren't you glad I gave you those names to say? (laughs) You're such a brat. (laughs) (laughs) Anyway, he studied ancient beings in his works, and it was his conclusions and writings that separated various mythical beings into four classes of elements. His archetypes were gnome or pygmy for earth, which is considered north, Undin or nymph for water, which is considered west, Vulcanus or salamander for fire, which is considered south, and I had a fire salamander growing up. Oh, that goes well together then, doesn't it? (laughs) Just had to throw that in there. And Sylvestris or sylph for air, which is considered east. Paracelsus described these creatures as not being spirits, but also not being creatures. He emphasized that they were something in between. For us, this is a hard concept to understand because as we study the stories about them, they can both appear as human in human clothing or be invisible. Paracelsus also did not call them elementals, but Sagony. These are nature spirits. Each elemental seems to have its own body type. Gnomes are short and pudgy. And I think they're kind of cute. I like them with their little (laughs) red hats. Yes, and I, I find them very cute as well. However, I tend to really relate to the earth elementals, so we'll see. Sylphs are similar to humans, but stronger, longer, and rougher. Undines are basically human in appearance and size, and salamanders are long, narrow, and lean. Since these beings are part of a particular element, they can move freely through that element. But this is all according to Paracelsus. We know that the belief in these creatures goes back way before this time. Yeah, Kelly, when you hear a lot of people talking about the elementals, they just kind of go back to Paracelsus, give you his definitions of everything, and then go forward. And I'm like, clearly, elementals, if we believe they're real, for one thing, go back to the beginning of time. (laughs) Certainly. But we know that in all kinds of myths and legends, they've been talked about for centuries, long before this guy ever put pen to paper about them. Absolutely. Although it is nice to reference. It is. And I like the classifications that he had here. He seems to know a little something about it because as you listen to other people talk about it, you look back at the past legends, you see how they kind of fit into where they're putting them. Right. Ancient cultures in the Middle East and East referred to four elements also, kind of how we do today. But these references of elements is actually classical. That's what they'll call them today is those are the classical elements because now science has moved forward. Yeah, definitely. They would call them something like wind, though, instead of air. So they might not necessarily have said fire, earth, air. Right. Well, they had a variety for each individual one. Exactly. Many cultures, especially in places like China and Japan, would refer to a fifth element even that was described as void. And it was also called the ether. You'll hear people talking about it's out there in the ether. Right. You hear ether all the time when you're trying to figure out something with your computer. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) The blue screen of hell. It's just ether. Yeah, exactly. China would even press that elements were not physical, but more transitional. And they would also include metal and wood as some of their elements. Perhaps this is where the idea of elements as spirits got its start. Because if they're more of a transitional thing, then they must not be physical. If they're transitioning in such a way that they're going from one thing to another. Right. They're not as static, I guess. Yeah. I find that fifth classification, the void or the ether, to be very interesting. This was a basic way to say that we have four types of matter, but there's a fifth that's beyond our material world. This fifth element is said to not have a spirit connected to it. So while all these other elements have their own spirit to it, the ether doesn't have a spirit. It's just, I've even heard it called zero. Yeah, it's void. (laughs) And what are we when we die? This energy or matter. That's why I don't believe that when we die, that's it. Because I believe we're made out of energy. I think science proves that we're made out of energy. It has to go somewhere. And science has proved that energy continues. It has to go somewhere. Exactly. So we don't just, as far as I'm concerned, turn into dirt and go into the earth because that energy has to do something or go somewhere. Agreed. This energy or matter is going to be beyond the physical world. Hinduism also has their void, which they call the Akasha, and that the human body seems to dissolve into all of these elements upon death. Plato was believed to be the first to use the term element, and Aristotle took it further, breaking the elements down into qualities. So earth is cold and dry, air is hot and wet, water is both cold and wet, 
and fire is hot and dry, which makes sense. That kind of goes with what elements they are. Right. And then, of course, things get even deeper when you look at Native American cultures or I would say any kind of indigenous cultures, because I don't want to just keep it here to Native Americans. Right. But they have a variety for each and every individual circumstance, whether it's thunder, lightning, air, dew, what have you. Yeah. Trees, rocks, they all have their own spirit. Yes. They break the elementals into more than just these four elements. I mean, it's all of these different kinds of nature spirits. Absolutely. As we move down through history, we come to alchemy. The science of alchemy has always been tied to elementals. After all, Alchemy is about changing matter, and in order to do this, elements must be used. Alchemy basically shows up during medieval times, and it was Arabic alchemist Jabir ibn Hayyan, which I probably mispronounced, who not only laid out the four elements, but added mercury and sulfur into the mix. Alchemy is not just a physical science, but also philosophical. And as we look at elementals, there is more philosophy and spirituality there than basic science. And speaking of basic science, we know we have scientists out there screaming that there are more than four elements. Clearly, we have a periodical chart with lots of elements on it, and these are broken down into four states of matter, solid, liquid, gas, and plasma. Although we could argue that those are basically the four elements, too. Yeah, so basically that's what I was talking about when I said there are these four classic elements. A lot of scientists today don't want to say air, fire, water. It's too basic for them. Right. And so they're like, no, we've proven that matter comes in different states. It's all the same to me because a solid, earth, liquid, water, gas, air, plasma, fire. To me, it's all the same thing. It's just using different words. It's all essentially related. Exactly. And obviously, we have different minerals and things like that, too, that could be considered maybe parts of elements or things like that. But Definitely. And they all combine differently and react differently. It's just a part of nature. <laughs> and here we try to mix science with philosophy and the spiritual. There are going to be people who don't agree that you can put those together, but I think you can. It can get muddy sometimes, but I definitely believe that you can. So History Goes Bump has had an episode called The Legend of Fairies. And there might be some people who go, well, isn't this basically the same thing as that episode? When we did that episode, we mentioned elementals and that people sometimes classify them together. But traditionally, they are very different things. That's what I have learned is that they are definitely different. Their essential being isn't quite as developed in terms of the personality that people associate with fairies. I almost look at them as being fairies are more human, whereas elementals are not even close to being human. Yes. And and they have a very integral part. The elementals have a very integral part in our existence. And fairies are connected to different elements, but they aren't that element. Exactly. For example, you might have a water fairy that's connected to all different kinds of waters, whether it's a pond or a well or your tap water. (laughs) My bird bath. (laughs) but they aren't the water that's not their spirit they're just connected to it and so that's what the difference is between these two things and so when i hear people that are talking about elementals and they'll say well basically they're fairies or they'll say elementals and fairies in the same line as though they're the same thing i'm like no you're wrong about that yeah i definitely disagree with that Yeah, there was one guy, I was watching his video on YouTube, and he basically was describing elementals, and he goes, yeah, people call them by all these different names. They call them the Fae, Daemon, Skinwalkers, and etc. And I was like, "Mm, no, no, they don't. (laughs) Yeah, no, very different indeed. Now, one point that I did hear is that the Quran mentions the jinn, and that they're described as being elementals. Basically, whatever terminology they use in Arabic is the same that they would use for elementals. Right. We did an episode on the jinn. This was episode 157. And the interesting thing about the jinn is that supposedly their origins are that they were created from fire. But my question is, does this make them the fire elemental? I mean, based upon what I've heard and, and the information that we researched... 
I feel like they're separate. I feel like it's completely a different entity in terms of they are able to interact with the human species, but not. But it it doesn't seem like they're tied to one element over the other. I agree. And to me, they came from fire. They aren't the fire. Right. Exactly. And I think one of the main distinctions that we really can get here is that there's not a lot of interaction between elementals and humans. And now a little break for a word about one of our sponsors. Hey, Kelly, it's that time of the year for gift giving, and it's tough finding gifts for older people in your life who already have everything. (laughs) Like Mort? Hey, now. Well, I wasn't really talking about Mort, but this would be good for him, too. I'm talking about StoryWorth. This is an online service that helps your loved ones tell the story of their lives through these really great questions that share their memories and personal thoughts about their life. I gave it to my mom and it's been fun because you can choose what questions are asked or add your own. And then when your receiver answers, you get an email of that answer. The way this works is whoever you give it to gets a question every week for a year. And at the end, StoryWorth puts it all in a book. This includes any pictures that they might upload. And then they find it and give it to you as a beautiful keepsake book. So basically, it's really a gift for everyone. I really wish that I actually had one of these for each of my grandparents. Oh, I wish we had one for more. Stay tuned in the new year because I have plans in regards to that. And the questions that they ask are unique ones. It's not just where were you born? Where did you live? That kind of thing. The last question that my mom answered was about her favorite toys when she was growing up. Can you imagine getting those about your grandparents? That would be amazing. I would love that. If you guys want to give this great gift, and it's not just for the holidays, this would be good any time of the year. Sign up today by going to storyworth.com slash history goes bump. And that's all one word you'll get $20 off your first purchase. That's storyworth.com slash history goes bump for $20 off. What an amazing way to record your family's history. It absolutely is. And I am so excited about having StoryWorth sponsor the show. It's perfect for us. I'm going to buy it for me. When it comes to hauntings, we experience many different types of spirits. There are those who are human at one time, and then there are those who could be called unborn. This is something that is not human and never was. Obviously, elementals fall under this. Many claim that we cannot experience elementals or actually meet one. And we are taught from a young age that they are not real, but are they? There are so many stories of these ancient beings and pagans say that these beings are on a different plane or dimension, and that is why we may not experience them. Yeah, so it's kind of the same thing with children seeing spirits of any kind, whether it's a human ghost or some other kind of spirit, whether it's an elemental or a fairy or anything like that. We know kids are more open to that stuff. Absolutely. But we lose it. And why do we lose it? Because people tell us that's not real. You're not seeing that. It's not real. Don't believe in it. You're crazy. So it's the same <laughs> thing when it comes to elementals is that children are told there, there's nothing there. Exactly. There's nothing connected to that. Whereas a child might actually go out and be in the woods and hear the trees talking to them. I right. believe You're that's a possibility. Open, I think. Sure. And I believe like a lot of the pagans would describe elementals as being some kind of a multidimensional creature. You know, maybe Bigfoot is some kind of an elemental creature that's on a different dimension. And that's why we don't run across them as often. I mean, if you hear a haunting in regards to an elemental, very, very rare. And I know this is true because we had a hell of a time trying to find any hauntings that had elementals connected. Yes, definitely. So I think that's one of the reasons why is because not only are spirits just on a different plane to begin with, but an elemental seems to be on a whole nother dimension. Yeah, I I would definitely agree with that. It, It just seems like they're that unattainable contact except for very rare experiences. 
And a lot of people, when you describe elementals, I know before I really started studying them, I had a lot of the same feeling that I did about the djinn. I just automatically thought bad, evil. Right. Yeah. A lot of people think, oh my gosh, it's a demon and, you know, horrible. Yes. Stay away. (laughs) Yeah. An an elemental creature. What is that? Because if something was not human, it's harder for us to identify with it, number one. But number two, it's not going to have the same kind of spiritual or emotional kind of connections that humans have. Exactly. Yeah. You can't communicate the same. No. And I'm thinking that's why elementals might seem scarier to us. I'm sure. I'm sure. People don't, they immediately find fear in the things that they can't explain. So to me, there's no way that we could actually relate to each other. I agree. Because they're not developed in the same way that we are. We are totally different beings. And so we might interpret some of their behavior or actions as being bad or evil, but it's just that they're not... They they, don't react as a human because they're not a human. So we might be like, well, that was kind of cold or aloof or something. Well, it's because they wouldn't know how to have some kind of warmth about them or connection. Right. And really, when you start looking at elementals, we're about to start discussing that here. Sometimes humans aren't so great when it comes to the earth and the things that we do. And so they would have some negative feelings towards us for that. Yep. Now, in magic, there's all different kinds of magic. We talk about white magic, black magic, and there's also something called malignant magic. And this, to me, falls along the lines of black magic or dark magic. And a lot of the time, they say that elementals are created because they're conjured by malignant magic. Because that's the thing that's weird about elementals is we don't really know their origins. Where did they come from? Are they some kind of created being? If you believe in a god, did he create these elementals? I mean, I did that bonus cast on ghosts in the Bible, and I got into talking about the Nephilim and how God created these angelic beings. Some of them fell, and then these fallen ones mated with earth women, and they had these children that seemed to have developed into these Nephilim. And I've always thought that they're weird because I'm like, are they soul creatures or not? Because humans have souls, but I don't believe that angels or demons have souls because they're not the same thing as we are. Right. And we'll never truly have that answer. No, we (laughs) won't. Until we pass. (laughs) In my logical brain, if you mix something that is soulless with something that has a soul, what do you get? Yeah. So I I stand along the lines that the Nephilim... If they have a soul, it's not like what we have. And right. then that's where I honestly believe demons come from. I believe that they are the soul or whatever spirit of these Nephilim type creatures. And that's why they seem like they're very ancient, why they want to be in a human body because they want to be back into the, sure. have those feelings again. They want to be in the moisture that's within our body at the live show that I did up in West Virginia. I talked about exactly demons. And the reason why I think salt works against them is because they're already really dry Yes. And they want to be in a human body, which is 90% liquid because they want that liquid. They need that, yep. And that's why when you put salt anywhere around, they don't want to be anywhere near salt because not only is it purifying, but what does salt do? Dehydrating. Yes. I have a feeling that that's kind of what we're looking at with some of these things. But when we're trying to figure out where elementals come from, there could be all different kinds of things. And one of those things could be this malignant magic. This doesn't really make elementals or create them, but I think it wakes them up is when there's disturbances, like the earth is disturbed either through mining or we have some kind of construction going on. Right. And I mean, to me, at least that makes perfect sense, especially if it's in the immediate area of a water disturbance, if they're building a dam or creating a lake or, of course, doing a lot of construction and disrupting the earth. Dams is a really good point, because if you think about it, that is really disruptive. Mining is bad enough because you're drilling into something. Right. But water, you're stopping the flow. And a lot of energy is just like, bam. Exactly. That's why it's so deadly when a dam breaks, because you have all of that energy that's been packed in, and that force just comes out. Now, the interesting thing is when you talk to paranormal investigators about elementals, They'll tell you different things that will kind of help you to decipher if you are dealing with an elemental rather than some other kind of spirit. A lot of them will tell you that if you capture an EVP that has a really deep or gruff voice, 
that that's possibly an elemental that you're talking to. So we normally would say, oh gosh, that growl, if it wasn't a car engine, (laughs) was that a demon? You know, because if you hear something like that or deep or guttural, we always think of it as demonic. But is it? Could it just be an elemental trying to communicate? That is true. They don't like metal objects. And so these may have a tendency to disappear. So we'll hear a lot with people when they have hauntings. They'll be like, you know, my keys disappeared. Or, well, I have that problem anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Blame it on the elementals, Kelly. Okay. Duly noted. <laughs> that darn fire elemental took my keys again. Give them back. Scissors may disappear. I've heard stories of scissors moving around in people's homes. I think when I did the episode on Iceland... And we were talking about the different creatures there and they definitely believe in elves and they'll move roads and things so that they don't disturb elves. I think on that episode, we talked about how these scissors kept moving around in this woman's home. And that's... I believe I recall that too. She thought it was some kind of creature like that moving it around. I wonder if it was maybe an elemental that was moving these scissors around because it's this metal object. They can also be attached to crystals. If you think about an earth elemental... They are part of the earth. So if you're bringing crystals into your home, I've heard a lot of people say maybe you should cleanse them before you bring them in because you don't know what might be attached to that. So (laughs) that's probably there might be an elemental that's like, that's my rock. And you just took it. This is my treasure. Good advice. Maybe something that I should look into. (laughs) Yeah. Make sure that if you're bringing any crystals in here that you're. I only have a few. (laughs) Doing some kind of mumbo jumbo (laughs) around them to keep them clean. (laughs) Mumbo jumbo. Come on. (laughs) Earth elementals will cause animals to behave strangely, cause a person to have fear of being buried alive or fear of leaving their home. And they can do things like possibly cause earthquakes because they're a part of the earth. That could have been (laughs) one of the reasons why we had so many earthquakes in California. Yeah. Well, you know what? The gold rush. Tons of mining. Tons of mining. And of course, I had a lot of crystals. <laughs> oh, boy. Water elementals cause plumbing problems. Well, uh, we may. <laughs> we might have we a water may. elemental in our bathroom. <laughs> we may. It, it's been very curious. It has been doing that weird squealy thing and it got progressively worse and longer and louder. And then all of a sudden it's short again. appeased. Kelly, can you describe to the (laughs) listeners after we flush the toilet and the tanks filling back up, what is the noise that it makes? Nobody wants to hear that. I want to hear it. (laughs) (laughs) It's perfect. And it's really loud and even longer. But it, it, it has suddenly... Gotten shorter and not as loud. I think we appeased our water elemental. (laughs) I don't even want to know how we appease that water <laughs> elemental, but for now we have not had to change out the components in the tank. Yeah, it's it's kind of disturbing if we did appease them, but <laughs> they do but say it's luckily, worshiping the porcelain goddess if you're throwing up in it. Well, we haven't done that. So <laughs> I don't know what happened, but at least we do have the replacement parts when and if the need may arise. <laughs> <laughs> now, the other interesting thing that I heard that was linked to water elementals is if somebody tries to commit suicide using water. That's something that I've always thought is very hard for people to do is basically to drown themselves. Yeah, I can't imagine. I mean, that has to be (laughs) that has to be some amazing. Yeah, I could see like if you go out into a lake, but even then it just seems like your will yeah, would kick in and you would kick and scream and try to get back to whatever. Yeah. So that's something that they could do. And they also, obviously, it's water, so they can cause flooding. And possibly that's why we have dam breaks. Right. Although I think a lot of them that we've looked at in history, those dam breaks have been because somebody was cutting corners and didn't make them appropriately. Well, true, but they could have played a part. Fire elementals can cause spontaneous fires. A human that develops an obsession with fire might be touched by an elemental. Or if you see tongues of flame or balls of flame, that could be connected to the fire elemental. And we hear stories about spontaneous combustion. Is it a fire elemental causing that to happen because they are so mysterious and come out of nowhere? This is true. Very well could be. 
Air elementals can throw or break objects. So if you have things flying around your house, it may not necessarily be a poltergeist. The other thing connected to air elementals, which I my jaw dropped when I heard this, possibly sexual assaults they're connected to. Ugh, that is incredibly creepy. They can cause agitation and fighting in their locale. So if you're having a lot of fighting in your home, it could be that there is an air elemental in there causing right. it. People who commit suicide through the air by jumping from high places. Another thing they could be responsible for. <sighs> and obviously, when we look at nature, they could be causing tornadoes or strong gales and things like that. Hurricanes. And obviously, when we talk about ley lines, which are these invisible lines of energy all across the earth, you better believe that elementals are going to be connected to that, especially if they're the earth elementals. So I'm looking around, seeing if I can find any stories online about elementals. And I came across this one that was told by somebody going by the username Cylindark Child from the Philippines. And here is what this person wrote. I'm not sure how other countries perceive elementals to be, but here in the Philippines, they are called Encantos, Anitos, and so on. So I guess they have lots of different names. These Encantos and Anitos used to be worshipped by ancient Filipinos until Spain decided to force Christianity on us a few hundred years ago, and only then were they thought of as evil entities. Personally, I think elementals are a part of nature too, but were made differently, just like when someone would be born with an extra toe, no arms, no legs, etc., to me, they're like nature's special brothers and sisters. But of course, please do enlighten me if my understanding is wrong, because that was just an uneducated opinion formed based on what I've seen. The first story I have to share was when my family and I were on a three-day vacation in Baguio City, and I'm sure I said that wrong. I was around 16 or 17 at the time. This city is famous for its many hauntings, especially after the 1990 or 1991 earthquake that pretty much reduced the city to rubble. But I honestly don't think what I saw was a ghost. Somehow it had a different feel to it. The house that we stayed in was a vacation home owned by my mom's boss, and she was nice enough to let us use the place for free. The house was situated at the middle of the mountain, so you'd need to drive up as far as you could, or you could drive all the way to the top as well. The house only had one private room and two semi-private rooms because the rooms on the second floor may be separated by walls and two different doors, but both rooms are mezzanine types, so you could see the living room from where you were. On the first night, we were tired as hell because of the eight-hour drive to the city and spending the rest of the day shopping for trinkets to bring home to our friends. But since I just ate, I cannot go to sleep yet because of my acid reflux. So I decided to grab the book I brought from my bag. While I was reading, I noticed something flicker, like a quick flash of light in my peripheral vision. I looked up from the book into the window where I think I saw the light, but nothing was there. So I went on reading and it happened again. But this time when I looked up, I was in for a surprise. There was a bluish white ball of light. It wasn't very bright, but luminescent. I'm guessing it's as big as a volleyball or maybe slightly smaller. And if I were to estimate my distance from it, I'd say around 10 feet, far enough to see it clearly. I was scared at first, but for a person who's easily attracted to shiny things and sometimes too curious for my own good, I continued to watch it in awe. It looked almost magical. It bobbed up and down very slightly as it glided and left some sort of translucent, almost transparent tail like a comet as it moved. It's very interesting. Then it passed behind a tree. Again, to my surprise, it was emerged on the other side of the tree, but no longer as one white ball, but hundreds of tiny little swirling balls of light. It was awesome. I admit, I still felt a little scared, but it was too pretty to ignore. I was just thinking it sounded beautiful. Yeah, and you know me, I love to see colors as spirits, yes. so I'd totally be digging this. I had this feeling that whatever it was, it was playing with me. Then it passed behind another tree, and then when it emerged, it was one big ball again. By the third time it emerged, the window only had enough space, so I had to stand up and walk towards the window to continue watching it. It kept doing the same thing, compressed into a ball, scattering, then compressing every time it passes behind a tree, until it got so far up the mountain that I couldn't see it anymore. I don't know, but to me it was awesome. I've never seen something so unnaturally pretty in my life. Of course, just like any person would do, I told everyone about it. My sister was asking why I wasn't scared, and I admitted I was at first, but when I looked at it long enough, it looked so pretty, and it didn't seem to mean any harm. My stepfather said it might have been St. Elmo's fire, but after researching about it, St. Elmo's fire behaved differently, so I didn't really think it was what he had said it might be. Then I learned about swamp lights. Of course, there isn't a swamp anywhere near there, but I needed to find out what it was. But swamp lights are chemical reactions in the swamp that causes it to light, like methane mixing with something and it burns a white, sometimes blue light. 
but again, it didn't look like fire. Besides, fire doesn't glide the way the mysterious white light did, not to mention the shape, then scattering, then reshaping again. I left the city without any answers, but memories of the pretty lights. I even remember making a painting of it, but it just looked so pretty and mysterious that I needed to show everyone what it looked like. I have friends with different beliefs, Christians, Muslims, Satanists, atheists, Wiccans, and when my Wiccan friend saw the painting, she asked me what it was. I told her the story, and she said I might have encountered an elemental, and it might have been the wind, a manifestation of the sylph. I researched online right after she said it, but none of the images I saw were the same. However, what made me think that it really was an elemental was what she said, that they were neither alive nor dead, that they've taken a different evolutionary turn from most things, and the wind elemental is most commonly seen as a white or yellow light. To be honest, I'm really not sure what it was, but all I know is that I didn't feel the same fear I did when I experienced ghostly stuff, which is an interesting point to make. Yeah, definitely. Of course, I was afraid at first, but after a while, I just felt like I was drawn to it. I could just imagine how the ancient Filipinos would see this as, and no wonder they worship them. It sounds like a beautiful experience, to be honest. Absolutely. That would definitely be awe-inspiring, I would think, first of all, to just see something like that. Because anytime you see something like the Northern Lights... Oh, my gosh. (laughs) Yes. Yeah. So, I mean, to see something like that and then to see it right outside of a window... And then to have it like responding to you when you see it. Hey, look at me. I'm here. Yeah. I'm here. Almost like going boo and then (laughs) boo and appearing different ways. It's just. I mean, awe-inspiring for sure. And I do know that spirits do sometimes show up as orbs of light and things like that. But now maybe we're mistaking an orb of light for a spirit. And maybe it's not. It's more of an elemental type creature. It could be. It could be. Or this is just the way this kind of energy shows itself to us. I mean, when something's on a different plane, Kelly, there's so much stuff we don't understand. I mean, we don't understand time. (laughs) I think a lot of ghost stuff is a time thing. So I think this stuff possibly could be another dimension. It maybe it can't show itself completely or I mean it, it it could be a in that particular situation, maybe it didn't even know that it was being viewed. But it seems like it definitely was aware. Yeah, I mean, the the possibility is there, like you said, that it, it was clueless. It didn't know that he was even looking at it. It might just be making its rounds like it normally does, working its way up the mountain. Right. And that can be a definite experience in a lot of different circumstances. You know, That's kind of the thing that makes me think that this was not a human spirit is because it was making its way up the mountain until it just kind of disappeared. That doesn't seem like something a human spirit would do. Right. Possibly. Human spirits seem to stick around where their body might have been, where they have some kind of connection when they were in an earthly body. Right. And I just wouldn't see a human spirit as like jaunting its way up the mountain like that. Around around a, a location where they had a connection or people that they had a connection with. Yeah, I agree. So that was somebody's personal experience with something that could be an elemental, but there are some famous kinds of hauntings out there that could be elemental in nature. One of them was at Lep Castle, which we covered in a previous episode too. Yeah, so it was described as a short skeletal monster with sharp claws, a decayed face, and smelled like sulfur. Mm, Yummy. Super yummy. People describe it as looking like Gollum for any Lord of the Rings fans or a Gollum, I suppose. That's so- true. They probably all look kind of the same. I think that's where Gollum got his name <laughs> I from. I think so. So some believe that it was conjured by druids before the castle was there, while others claim that a fighting force conjured it in some way to bring fire to destroy the castle. Gerald Fitzgerald. Say that 10 times really fast. Gerald Fitzgerald. Gerald Fitzgerald. Yeah, yeah, no. (laughs) Not going to do it. Not going to do it. Is said to be the one who conjured it because he was adept at magic and tried to take over the castle several times. That would be malignant magic. This entity is dark and sinister. Mildred Darby had an experience with this, and here is her account. Suddenly, two hands were on my shoulders. I turned around sharply and saw as clearly as I see you now, a gray thing, standing a couple of feet from me with its bent arms raised as if it were cursing me. I cannot describe in words how utterly awful the thing was. Its very undefinableness, rendering the horrible shadow more gruesome. Human in shape, a little shorter than I am, I could just make out the shape of a big black holes like gray eyes and sharp features. 
But the whole figure, head, face, hands, and all was gray, unclean, bluish gray. Something of the color and appearance of common cotton wool, but oh, so sinister, repulsive and devilish. My friends who are clever about occult things say this is what they call an elemental. The thing was about the size of a sheep, thin, gaunt, and shadowy in parts. Its face was human, or to be more accurate, inhuman. In its vileness, with large holes of blackness for eyes, loose, slobbery lips, and a thick saliva dripping jaw sloping back suddenly into its neck, nose, it had none. Only spreading cancerous cavities, the whole face being a uniform tint of gray. This, too, was the color of the dark, coarse hair covering its head, neck, and body. Its forearms were thickly coated with the same hair. So were its paws, large, loose, and hand-shaped, and it sat on its hind limbs. One hand or paw was raised, and a claw-like finger was extended, ready to scratch the paint. Its lusterless eyes, which seemed half-decomposed and looked incredibly foul, stared into mine, and the horrible smell, which had before offended my nostrils, only a hundred times intensified and came up to my face, filling me with a deadly nausea. I noticed the lower half of the creature was indefinite, and seemed semi-transparent at least. I could see the framework of the door that led into the gallery through its body. The last time she saw this thing was in 1915. So apparently she had a few experiences with this thing. I cannot imagine. I mean, I can't imagine standing there long enough to get this kind of detail about it. Yes. Oh, how terrifying. That is a mental picture that she took that you just do not want to remember and... What she's described here, it's it's so interesting because when she's first describing it, you're imagining what it was initially described as, as this skeletal kind of creature. But then as she continues to describe it, all of a sudden you're seeing something that almost seems to be half animal. Like she starts describing its hands like their paws and there's so much hair on it. Yes. And I I got a definite whiff of... (laughs) it possibly smell. but then she also knew that its skin was gray it's just weird uh, it sounds like one of the most bizarre things clearly she had way too much experience with this entity and that's why it makes you think that that's what where they got the idea that it could be an elemental because it is just so weird it sounded to me like right. you mixed uh some kind of zombie half dead thing with uh bigfoot yeah and or this a is werewolf what, or, what came out or yeah something of that nature yeah yeah yep So just very interesting and a hideous thing. And of course, when we hear something stinking of sulfur, we always kind of connect it to demonic and it actually seemed to have a very sinister nature to it. Right, absolutely. Certainly not something I want to see in the middle of the night. It makes you think that possibly it was created by the druids. That some Well, not created, but that they conjured it somehow. Right. And so when they started putting this castle on what it might think is its domain, that that would have really angered it. And then there's all these wars that have happened there. And obviously, Lep Castle is very haunted, if you've listened to that episode. And some horrible things went down there, especially in the dungeon. So did it only continue to feed this? Because that's the other thing we don't know about elementals. Do like, they get fed by emotions? Yeah, because we know that you can maybe feed ghosts that way or these other kinds of spirits like demonic feeding it negative right. energy, uh, tulpas, things like that. It's like we feed it energy. Do elementals feed off of energy in that way? Yeah, that's a really good question. One of the other well-known elemental stories out there is the Felix Stowe fire demon. This happened in the fall of 1965. There was a group of British men who were hanging out in Felix Stowe, which is what this is named for. This is on the coast of the North Sea in Suffolk, England. They were driving and they pulled their car over near a forested area. I'm not really sure why they decided to pull over, (laughs) but one of the young men, his name was Michael Johnson. He jumps out of the car and runs into the forest. So his friends are all sitting there looking at each other and going, what came over him? If he's making a mad dash for the woods. I would think that he was needing to use the loo, shall we say? (laughs) Yeah, out in the (laughs) woods, something like that. They're waiting and he doesn't return. And then all of a sudden... This is the most bizarre story. They see what looks like some kind of a UFO or craft in the air. They're freaking out because it looks like this big ball of fire in the sky. Did he have a burrito? (laughs) Sorry. (laughs) That's horrible. horrible, Kelly. I'm sorry. (laughs) 
Yeah, we know what your friend was doing out there in the woods. So anyway, they see this thing that looks like some kind of UFO. They're totally terrified. And then it occurs to them, oh my gosh, Michael's out there in the woods, but they're not getting out of the car to help him. Aww. So this thing takes off, goes somewhere else. And then all of a sudden they see Michael come stumbling out of the forest and he falls down into the middle of the road in front of them and he's unconscious. So they get out of the car. They check to make sure that he's still alive. He is. They pile him into the car and take him over to the hospital. And they're all just freaking out. Like, you know, what the hell did we just see? Well, Michael comes to. And when he does, at first he had a little bit of amnesia. Like he couldn't remember anything. And then it started to come back to him. And he told his friends and the doctors that the reason why he rushed into the forest is because something compelled him to. It was like he felt like That's he so had to. Bizarre. He gets into the forest and he runs into this very weird creature that he described looking like some kind of humanoid, but it had large sloping eyes that were glowing in the darkness. And here's the really weird thing. It was completely engulfed by orange flames. And he said he just blacked out and then he woke up here in the hospital. The doctors found burn marks on his neck. Oh, my gosh. So and as you though know this what? creature. As a side note, I think he needs new friends. Yeah, no kidding. I'm like, dude, go Please. running into the forest out and be like, hey, are you okay? Oh, no. I mean, at least they didn't just take off in the car and abandon him. Right. I kind of thought that were that was where it was going initially. But this is a really interesting story to hear that this is some kind of a burning man. It's this thing that is just engulfed in flame. Because right. you would at first think, okay, UFO, was this some kind of an alien creature? But I've never heard of an alien creature being engulfed in flames before. So when I hear the description of this, it kind of makes me think, going back to the comic books, you've got the Human Torch. Makes you wonder if that was not somehow inspired by a story like this. Right. Definitely could be. And the fact that he had those burn marks on his neck. I mean, that is terrifying. Something for, happened. For what he experienced. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, I can't you, even imagine. You could look away from him and be like, okay, he, you know, I don't know. He just went out in the woods and freaked out. His friends, they saw something strange. It was nothing. But when somebody has some kind of evidence on their body, it's pretty hard to ignore that. Oh, definitely. There was also a story of a burning man that goes back to 1125. And this was in Railbuck, Germany. A group of people described seeing a burning man who had fire coming from his nose and mouth and that they could see his burning ribs. So it's like they could see into his body and make out his ribs and he was oh just engulfed gosh. in these flames. And you would initially want to believe that, oh, this is somebody who caught on fire and is running through the city. But that's not the way they saw it. It was this creature that just kept going. I don't know. How long can a person stand before the fire yeah, would force them to fall on the ground? Definitely not long. So it had to have been something weird. And in Germany, they have the Black Forest there. There are so many stories coming out of this place. Right. It, I've heard many. It's said to be infested with these elementals. So uh, you can only imagine what kinds of stories are coming out of there about these kinds of creatures. Yeah. One day, I I'd like to go visit my motherland. <laughs> <laughs> being the majority percentage of my heritage as a German, but yeah, I, I don't know that I'll be going there. <laughs> yeah, I don't think I'll be hiking in the Black Forest, thanks. Yeah, I'll, I'll probably take a pass on that. So the question is asked, how do you get rid of an elemental? You can't destroy them or completely banish them, but you can release them into their realm. You can make peace and coexist too. I guess just like you would with a ghost. Right. Yeah, definitely. You know, I think in certain circumstances, there's a lot more to be said for respect and kindness and trying to coexist than trying to, quote unquote, banish. Yeah. And I would think you could treat them the same way that you would like when we have our garden. If you put out a little bowl of milk or something to ask the fairies to come and take care of your garden it might be a very similar thing with them. Right. And I know in certain circumstances, depending upon where where you think the elementals from, you know, definitely if it's a Native American thing or something along those lines in that belief system that a shaman would be the best person to get you help with this. I but, think that'd be the first person I would call. Yeah, definitely. Is a shaman or if you know somebody who I mean, there's still druids out there. If there's somebody who practices that. Right. I would go for somebody who has some kind of ancient practice. yeah definitely needs that type of experience yeah so not a whole lot of answers there for how to get rid of an elemental if you're having an issue with one but 
overall, I think it's more of a peaceful coexistence and yeah. and offering something up. And I believe that it's something that you want to do on a regular basis. It's not like a mm-hmm. one time, here you go, here's an offering. It's more of like, a we're going to have this symbiotic relationship. I'm going to offer these to you on a regular basis. And let's just coexist peacefully. I think following Iceland's lead is probably best. Definitely. Working around them, appeasing them, offering them gifts and things. Good idea. Elementals are something to explore connecting to. And perhaps you guys out there will find a class that you're drawn to. For me, I've always been drawn more to water. The Undens help not only to cleanse water, but also the emotional and subconscious world. What do you think you're most connected to, Kelly? I'm definitely most connected to gnomes. I mean, I have heard it said that they are the ones that not only you know, help within the environment. But if there's injured wildlife, they will help rescue them, treat them medically and heal them. That's always something that I have done in my past and something I'm definitely drawn to. So I've always felt connected with gnomes. Yeah, that's really cool because that's how it's been for me with water. I mean, that's one of the reasons why I moved to Florida because the first time I ever flew into here, I was 16 years old. I was coming with my best friend and her family on a trip to Disney World. And I looked down at Florida and all I saw was water everywhere. And I went, oh, my gosh, I love this place. And that's awesome. That's why I came here because I love water. I'm very connected to it. So everybody heard this. So if I find an injured snake, I'll just bring it home and mend it. (laughs) So the other thing that gnomes are really. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, God. The other thing that gnomes are really good for is cleaning up discord and negativity on a spiritual level. Aww. So that's a great thing to be connected to. Yeah. Sylphs purify the mental plane of negative thoughts like hatred, anger, resentment, pride, greed, and jealousy. So they help to sweep those out. And salamanders are agents of bringing fire to mankind through electricity, firelight, or candle flame. And they are responsible for the spark of life and they keep it from decaying or disintegrating. So I would look at salamanders as being renewing, which definitely makes total sense to me because fire is for purifying and the phoenix rises from the ashes, that kind of thing. So if you feel a connection to salamanders, you probably are looking to maybe restart your life, purify, move forward, that kind of thing. Perhaps explore one, something you could think about doing after you listen to this episode and see what you're feeling connected to. And we are coming into a brand new year. Oh my gosh, Kelly, we're moving into 2020. This year has just flown by. The fabulous 20s. Can we be flappers again? Oh my gosh. Oh yeah, I'm on board. I love the music. (laughs) Me too. Hey. And I asked the listeners, see if you find that elementals do exist. Because, after all, that is for you to decide. Kelly, this was absolutely fascinating to do this study on elementals. Definitely. I, I learned a lot and I've been drawn to learning more about them. So it was really fun for me and very informative. I want to encourage you guys to check out the website at historyghostbump.com. And if you want to send me some feedback, you can do that at historyghostbump at gmail.com. And I did hear from a couple of listeners. First, Rosie wrote, I recently listened to your Haunted Churches of York episode and had a little chuckle to myself when you mentioned All Saints North Church. I was involved in an archaeological dig in the churchyard about five years ago, and she sent me a photo of her doing that, and she's holding a Roman tile that she found on the surface of a Victorian grave. The grave diggers had mixed up the soil when the grave was dug. I can confirm that the stained glass is amazing in this church. Apparently, it only survived the Civil War because the parliamentarian general who took the city of York threatened to make anyone who smashed the glass pay for it to be replaced. I think we all owe him a small debt. Sadly, we didn't see the 1940s lady, even though we ate our dinner in the garden every day. Well, thank you for sharing that picture with me, Rosie, and the thoughts about the stained glass, since it's something I haven't been able to see with my own eyes. And you never know, maybe you'll have to go traipsing through that garden again some other time and see if any ghosts come along. I also want to thank Mary for your email saying that you absolutely love the podcast and that it has helped get you through a very tough week. I'm glad to be of service in that kind of way. 
Jen also wrote to say that she loves the show. And she said in your most recent episode, you talked about getting into craft beer. You should check out the app Untapped. Well, I am already on Untapped. I think it is a phenomenal app. And if you are into craft beer, I encourage you guys to get on it too so that you can kind of check out all the different craft beers that are on there. And I'm under History Goes Bump. So if you want to follow me or friend me, that kind of thing on there, connect with me. You can do that. I'd be happy to connect with you. And she also suggested a great haunted location in Missouri that I've added to my list. And then finally, I got an email from N. Kelly, who wrote, I can't remember exactly where I heard about HGB, but I have a feeling that it was from Bizarre States. I only recently have been listening during my drive from Asheville, North Carolina to Madison, Wisconsin for the Thanksgiving holidays. It's been fun to hear about good old Asheville in the podcast. And of course, my most favorite ghost tour I've ever been on was in Asheville. I've been loving it and I wanted to share some of my stories. I don't really talk about them because I have hardcore non-believers in my friends group and they chalk it up to my active imagination. I'm an author, but I know what I've experienced. My first encounter with the paranormal happened when I was five or six. I remember sneaking into my parents' room when they were in the bathroom. I hid under the covers so I could scare them. While I wasn't doing a very good job at stealth, I felt someone sit on the bed, so I jumped out and said, boo. Strangely, no one was there. I don't know what makes me think this was my aunt who I'd never met. And she had let me know that her aunt had passed away and she had never met her before. Another memory from my childhood was shortly after Tasha, the cat I had known all my life, had sadly passed. I remember crying in bed that night when I felt something jump onto my bed and curl up next to me. When I looked, there was nothing there, but I knew it was Tasha, letting me know she was okay. I love stories about ghost animals like that. I do too. And just so my lost furries know, I wouldn't mind you curling up next to me sometime. Absolutely. I've never had that ever happen before. I, I've had a couple experiences with what I thought was my, my little heart dog back after she passed, but it was pretty brief. And at the time, I hadn't explored too much or done any investigating. So your your mind tends to kind of explain things away, shall we say. And as we're talking about this, our pups are all over. <laughs> Riley is like trying to scratch up onto my lap and yes. everything. So it's kind of interesting that we're talking about <laughs> pets and fur babies and all of a sudden she's interested. Fast forward to high school when I was part of the youth group for the Basilica of St. Lawrence. Now, at this stage, I was pretty fed up with the whole Christian thing, and this youth group was the final straw. But we're here to talk about ghosts and the paranormal. So while I was engaged with the group, I always felt uncomfortable in the church. It wasn't that I was being a soul in teen, but something else. I hated being there at night and alone. There was this feeling of being watched, and anytime I was alone, my hair would stand on end. I've talked to other people, and they felt the same thing while in the church. I don't know what it is, but I know something is there. I would say to listen to your gut. And I told her, as Rosie just talked about haunted churches in York, I wrote back to her and said, well, I just did an episode on haunted churches in York. And so clearly churches can be haunted. Definitely. In my senior year, I did my senior project on paranormal investigations. Pretty cool, right? So during my project, I got to go to the Grove Park Inn to investigate the Pink Lady, which we've done an episode on. While we were in the atrium near her room, I decided to go up to the next floor. It was a switchback staircase, and when I turned the corner to go up the final flight, I froze. At the top of the stairs was a shadow person. It had to have been at least seven to eight feet tall, which is what we hear about shadow people all the time. Right. As soon as I saw it, it shifted down the hall. Excited, I hurried up the stairs and turned on my camera, (laughs) but there was nothing. I told her, I said, you're crazy chasing down a shadow person. (laughs) As I walked around up there, I was overcome with a feeling of dread and it suddenly was really cold. I started to get nauseous and had to retreat back downstairs. The feeling didn't let up until I left. That was the experience that cemented my belief. I've gone on a few ghost hunts with my uncle when I visit, but I've been busy with work and I lost all my equipment in a move. But my uncle has caught great EVPs and pictures. He caught a picture of a spirit in the woods behind the Lakeview Sanitarium in Madison, Wisconsin. And I can't remember how he found out, but we believe her name is Judith. And she sent me that picture and it looks like somebody standing in the woods. I'll show it to you, Kelly. Oh, wow. Yeah, it totally does. It's a definite form. Yeah. So I don't know. Is it a ghost or not? All right. Well, I want to thank everybody for tuning in to this first episode that Kelly has officially (laughs) joined me as co-host. Here we go, guys. Jump on the ride. (laughs) (laughs) So thanks for joining us. You guys take care now. Bye-bye. This episode has been brought to you by StoryWorth and our executive producers. Dispatches from the Grave Digger.
First, I want to thank Jenny Rains for her one-time donation. And then we want to welcome into the cemetery, Rachel Lindsay. You're going to be buried under a marble headstone. Thank you so much for your support of the show. Thanks, guys. Sweet dreams. 